Welcome to the Frugalpreneur Podcast. I am your host, Sarah St. John, and my guest today is a blogger, speaker, online business coach, and has spent the last decade guiding and directing creative professionals on how to pursue meaningful work. He is the author of Your Message Matters, How to Rise Above the Noise and Get Paid for What You Know. Welcome to the show, Jonathan Milligan. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to have you here. For people watching the video, this is the book that I just referenced. I love this book. But before we get into all of that, I'd love to hear more about your background, history, how you even got into this area. So I started as a high school teacher. My parents were both educators. My, my mom was an elementary teacher growing up. My dad was a high school teacher and basketball coach. And so I thought that was the avenue for me. And after a couple of years of teaching, I love to teach, but I found that the classroom for me was a little bit too constraining. I didn't like the bell to bell schedules and I wanted more entrepreneurial freedom and, you know, all that exploring my creativity and, you know, all those things. So I went on a journey. I really, back then, I didn't know what I was going to do. So then after a couple of things, trying this and that, I fell into this idea of starting a blog and it was in 2009. I started a blog originally for career professionals. Then I focused it in a little bit on helping accounting professionals with their careers. And then that little blog started just picking up steam and growing an audience and started figuring out, well, maybe I can earn money with this. So then I started exploring, well, how do you do an online course and how do you get paid for doing a resume? And then things just built from there. So by 2011, about two and a half years later, I was basically blogging back then full time. Then I got into podcasting. Then I started teaching all this stuff because a lot of people were asking me, well, man, how did you like work on this business on the side and grow it into something? And that's what I love about this kind of business is you don't have to quit your day job and put all your chips in. This is like a low cost, easy business that you can start on the side and just work on it over time. And that's what I love. And that's my story. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that's kind of the route I took as well. And it kind of interesting though, how you pivoted with your blog further niche down and then you got into podcasting and then now you have an online membership. But yeah, I think that's really interesting. How does someone know then when it's time to pivot or niche down further or try something else? Right. So the thing that I often find working with a lot of clients is they tend to go too broad because it's logical. I did the same thing. I don't want to be too narrow because then logically we think it's going to be harder to reach my audience. But the truth is, if no one is raising their hand and saying, ooh, this is for me, then you haven't focused it enough. And what I found for the messaging part is as soon as I positioned myself as an accounting career coach, all of a sudden they started paying attention to me. Because if you think about it from an accountant standpoint, they're wanting career advice and help and they're looking at their options online. And wait a minute, this guy specifically works with accounting people. He's my guy because he gets me. And if no one's saying that, oh, well, that person gets me, then you know you haven't really dialed in the messaging yet. And then the other part that you asked, the second part of the question is, how do you know when it's time to make that pivot? I probably jumped in too early. I'm a little bit more risky. And looking back, I'm like, well, you know, that was kind of risky. I had a wife and two young kids. Even though I was making money, I was kind of pushing it all in. But I think it, it really depends on the individual. And if you follow a methodology that I've used for years called Profit First, it really helps you to know what you categorize the money you are making in your side hustle, what gets categorized. And so when you have enough in the owner's pay account, for example, oh, well, I've got like six months or nine months, or I've got a year's worth of income sitting in my owner's pay account, and I know everything else will be taken care of. That's when you know. And so it really depends on the person. I love how in your book, you talk about a lot of different things, but it's all centered around using your expertise, monetizing your expertise, so to speak. So how did you get the idea to write this book? And I'd love to talk about some of the subject matter in there as well. Absolutely. So the, the idea of the book was kind of an aha moment one day. So I, I used to sell a course when I was just the blogging guy. I used to sell a course called Blogging Your Passion University. And on the last day, we enroll people twice a year. On the last day, I said, hey, I'm going to hang out on live chat and I'm going to just answer every one of your questions. 
And so I was preparing that day to be like the conversations I was going to have would be like, well, do you talk about this in your course? And do you cover this? And, you know, so I was preparing me for that. None of that happened. I was shocked. I was having multiple conversations all day long. And the number one thing that they talked about was Jonathan, I know that your program could help me, but I just don't know if I can do it. I don't know if my message matters. I don't know if someone would pay me for my advice. I don't know if I have anything worth sharing. And I kept hearing that over and over again. And I walked away going, wow, it's not that they don't believe in the product. They don't believe in themselves. And that's when I knew that's when I wanted to write a book. And so I think what surprises a lot of people is the first half of the book is more personal development. It's like understanding you. How are you wired? What are your strengths? Defining your message, like building a business around how you show up best for others. Then the last part of the book is actually the practical marketing advice. So I didn't want to just write a marketing book. I wanted to really help someone define what they do best and create a business around that. Yeah. And I love how the book is broken up because I love alliteration. And so like you have the first parts like define your message, purpose, people, and passion, and then market your message, create, capture, compile, connect, and live your message, encourage hearts, educate heads, empower hands. And I just love how it's very organized. Well, that's the teacher and me coming out, right? It's like, so you, so the old habits die hard. And it's like, as a teacher, I've got to make sure the students get it. How can I make it memorable? How can I break it down to its simplest parts? And so that's a little bit of my teacher coming out of me. And one of the things you talk about in the book are the four big reasons why your message matters. And I'd love for you to go into that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's probably more than four. But specifically, I wanted to give real examples of people so that you could really understand. And so even more important than four, six, seven, eight, I use examples of Walt Disney. That was a classic example. And it's funny because I read an 800 page biography of his and I don't normally read books like that. And some of it was dry, kind of hard to get through, but I was reading it. And then that story that I shared in the book came out and it was that moment in time when Walt Disney was really almost broke and unsure and he got an opportunity to get in front of a big movie producer and that movie producer watched his little cartoon reel, stopped it halfway through, laughed at him in his dream and said, no one will pay attention to a mouse. Housewives hate rats. They don't like mice. This will never work. And then stormed out. I just think in that moment, we could have almost lost Disney, Walt Disney World, all of those things. But at that moment, he had to make a decision. Did his message matter? And I think that's important. But we cover a lot in that. But that was probably the most powerful story that I came across that I shared in that section. Yeah, I love that story. One of the things, well, how I was first introduced to you even before the book was you were on a, I guess it was like an online summit. And you were talking about having like kind of how books and podcasts can coexist and basically a book funnel where you can go on a podcast as a guest and have a book. What you said in that was just so eye-opening, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So books are great because books, people get them in their hands. And some, even if you can create an audio book, there's some people who are audiobook people. And I get that not everybody's a reader. But there are a lot that are. And if you can put your message or your framework into a book and someone consumes that, then you've got a, such a stronger relationship with that person, right? I, I know for me, that's what's true. It's like, I call them mentors from afar. There have been these authors that have been mentors for me from afar. And it's like, I got to know them in a book. So books are incredibly powerful. So what we can do though, and this came out of a talk with a book launch expert, somebody I'd known for a while. And right before my book launched, he said, well, tell me your ideas. And I started listing all these marketing ideas. And he's like, Jonathan, you can't have your cake and eat it too, because I've done lots of these book launches. What do you want? He forced me to get really specific on what I wanted. And I said, what I want is to gain a customer or gain 
their contact information so I can build the relationship beyond the book. Because for me, and this is true for a lot of authors, you don't make a living just selling books. As an author, you're probably going to make $3, $4 for a book you sell. And so really what it is, it's, it's a tool to get it in people's hands that want to go deeper in a relationship. But if somebody walks into a bookstore and buys a book, I always think about how many books I've read that I really, really enjoyed, but I never got on that person's list. I never bought any of their products, even though I really, really enjoyed their book. And so for me, even though my book's available in bookstores, what I ultimately decided was to set up like a free book, a shipping funnel, and then go get out on podcast and talk about the conversation. And those who resonate with that are going to go get the book. And when they get the free book, just pay shipping, then now you have a contact information to develop the relationship. And it's very important. It's not you get them on your list and you're just going to sell, 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 right? You got to keep the relationship building going. How can I continue to add value, continue to offer help? And so that's a strategy that's worked really well for me. And I also teach it to clients in my program and they're seeing some real success, even though it's their first book they published and they don't have a large audience because it's not difficult to get out there and get on a bunch of podcasts. Yeah. And I think a lot of people think that the way to make money from books is to sell them, you know, yeah. to uh, direct monetization. But really, if you're a business and your goal is to get either leads or a community, I think doing like the book funnel, the free plus shipping, or even, and this is what I've done like on Amazon, because I've self-published three books, but you know, on the first page of the look inside, it'll have some sort of lead magnet type thing. The person doesn't even have to buy the book to actually. Yep. Yeah. So there's so many ways, I think, creative ways to use a book that people just aren't aware of. And then, yeah, like guesting on podcasts and that being kind of your, where they say, well, where can you find me or where, mm -hmm. where can people find you? Having a domain like you have, which since we're talking about it is your message matters book.com. And you can see that book funnel in, in live time, I guess you could say. Yeah. Uh, if you go there and see how that works, and then you can just have a domain that you talk about on a podcast. And yeah, I think it's a great way to kind of leverage both books and podcasts. It absolutely is. Because, you know, before I really got into podcast guesting, I was doing a lot of guest articles back in the day. Guest blogging was a good way to get out there. But if you think about how much work it takes to write a really good blog post. You got to edit it. You got, it's got to be tailored to that audience. And it's just that back and forth. Whereas as a guest, you just got to be prepared to show up and give a really good interview and talk about your book, which is something you're already passionate about. And then the person on the other end is going to do the editing, the publishing of it. Right. And of course, you want to be a good guest and come back and promote it, but that's where it doesn't take as much time, effort, and energy. You do have to make time for it, but it works really well. One thing, I was kind of like looking through your book again today at some of the things that I highlighted, and one thing that you said that really kind of stood out to me was that there's a difference between a serial entrepreneur and a simultaneous entrepreneur, because I always call myself a serial entrepreneur. But I love how you differentiate between those. Can you explain that? Absolutely. So I was a simultaneous entrepreneur. In the very, very beginning, I was trying to get three. I had like three blogs, thinking about starting a fourth. I had two podcasts, and yet I wasn't making full-time income. So on top of that, I still had my job. I knew I had a problem when I wrote a, a blog post one day, and I was like, which blog do I put it on? Now we think, well, we're spreading ourselves out. We are, you know, we're taking less risk. We don't have all of our eggs in one basket. You know, it's all fun to say, but what I didn't realize was, wait a minute, if I'm using WordPress, I've got to update plugins on every site. I have to connect them to my email list provider on every site. I'm maintaining three sites. There's all this triple the amount of time and energy if you're not careful. And so a simultaneous entrepreneur tends to have their energy spread out in lots of different ways. It's kind of like taking one step in 10 directions as opposed to a serial entrepreneur who works on a business, gets the systems in place, and then they start another. And so we see these people who 
you know, they've got multiple businesses, but the truth is they probably didn't start all of them at the same time. They worked on one, got the systems in place, got it functioning, put their energy toward the next one. And so in that case, it's more like taking 10 steps in one direction. The question is for everyone out there, do you want to take one step in 10 directions or would you rather take 10 steps in one direction? It's the same amount of effort and energy, but one of them actually goes somewhere. Yeah, I love that because I had never even heard of simultaneous entrepreneur. I just heard serial entrepreneur, but that makes sense. Or, or you could even look at it as like a pie or a pizza where it's like, if you have one business that you're focusing a hundred percent on, you get the whole pie or pizza. But if you have eight different things going on, then you're only getting one slice basically. And, and I've made that mistake working on a few different things at one time. And it's like, none of them can really get very far when you're spreading yourself thin that way. So I think, yeah. like you said, focusing on one thing and going all in on that. But of course it can take people a while sometimes to figure out what that one thing is, but right. <laughs> yeah. So I know you have an online community. Uh, I think you call it the fast track lab. Mm -hmm. Can you explain, cause I've actually thought about, it, I need to join that <laughs> cause all the courses on there, I'm like, oh, that would be good. And that one would be good. Can you explain more about that community? Absolutely. And so it's a membership. So it's a monthly membership. And then I show up twice a month. One of them is uh, a class. We call it the fast track class. And the second one a month is office hours. And then of course, all the past classes, there's like 80 some classes in there now are all on demand, able to go watch that cover all aspects of growing a business online. It's kind of like one student called it Netflix for content creators. I'm like, well, that's probably a pretty good description, but the deeper thing about it is in my book, I talk about that there's four influencer voices, writer, speaker, teacher, or coach. And there's even a little assessment in there that can help you identify what kind of comes to the top for you. And so for me, teacher comes to the top. And because of that, I love to do live streaming, weekly live streaming in my Facebook group. And then I love to have a membership site where it's my virtual classroom. I get to choose what the topic is every single month. I get to teach it. And then once a month, I get to just take all kinds of questions and answer questions and try to help as many people as I can. And so, so yeah, it's called Fast Track Lab, but maybe the meaning behind why I chose to do that could be helpful because when you align stuff with where your motivation is, it's so much easier. Cause I know there's people that I've worked with that are like, I could never do a membership site. Like I could never come up with a new thing to talk about every month that I could never do that. And that I started realizing, well, wait a minute, maybe that's because I love membership sites because I'm more of a teacher and maybe they're something different and that's okay. So find the thing that you do or have motivation to do. And that's where you're going to shine. That's where you're going to show up best for people. Yeah. And I think you kind of touch on that in your book. There's several different ways for people to present their expertise, whether it's an online membership, like you're talking about, or a book, a podcast, a course. What are some other ways? I think maybe a summit was one of them. Mm -hmm. So well, the way I categorized it, I mean, there's 12 different income streams that I talk about, but I categorized them under writer, teacher, speaker, and coach to really help people think about ways that maybe it's a way to start. Now, the truth is we can develop skills in all four of those areas. So just because you take the assessment and you're like, oh, writers like the bottom, I could never write a book. No, it's a skill that can be developed. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not even that you have to do all 12. It's finding two or three that match you and using that to create multiple income streams. So for example, using what we talked about, I like to have like a low ticket offer, some kind of a subscribe offer, and then like a higher ticket offer. And if just having those three offers can do so much for your business. So for me, book, and then you've got Fast Track Lab, which is around a $45 a month membership. And then I've got my higher ticket coaching that's up around six, $7,000 where we work with people and they get assigned a coach and we get more personally involved in their business. And so the model can be that simple. And then you're just moving people through, right? So the people who are ready and more serious and committed, and they want that accountability, they can go for the bigger commitment 
those that aren't, you've got a subscription model in your business that helps kind of keep the business stable. So one gives you the customers, the middle one subscribe gives you the recurring revenue and then the higher end ones where it kind of puts the profit in your business. Have you ever had anyone go straight for the high end coaching? Yes. And it's oh, happened wow. here. Here's how it's happened. I had someone I've had, I've had this happen a couple of times, but I'll give you one example. Someone heard me on a podcast, got the book, consumed the book in a week, booked a call for the coaching, bought that high ticket program. And we just happened that next week to be doing my live event. So I do a live event every year, two day live event called your message matters live. Well, for the high ticket group coaching, we do a kind of a boot camp only for them the day before the two day event. And he was sitting at one of the tables and he's like, three weeks ago, I heard you on a podcast. Now I'm here. And so it can happen that fast. But if you have a system, like I've described where it goes, podcast, book, I like the book, book a call, then get into your high ticket coaching. But that doesn't always happen. You have to remember some people are like, they're ready, right? They're like, they already know what they want to do. They were just looking for like, the tracks to run their train on. So it doesn't always happen that way, but it can. Yeah. And I think that's a good example of the power of having a podcast or being on podcasts and having a book as well. Another thing I was going to ask was about outsourcing. Do you outsource or do you have a team that handles these things for you? Like whether it's administrative type things or scheduling or even I, maybe you do all your sales calls directly. I don't know, but I'm just kind of curious how that works out for you. Absolutely. So in the beginning, it is just you. I wore all the hats and that's okay. I mean, you need to know in develop. That's why I say starting a business is one of the greatest self-development journeys you'll ever go on because it really challenges you to do things. Now, eventually you can't do it all. So you got to start thinking, how can I get help on lower revenue generating things so that I can focus on the higher revenue generating things? And so for me, it was started first by actually documenting what I was doing. That's key. Like so many people want to just go out and like, in the beginning, I, I made this mistake, actually. I, I decided I was just going to go hire someone and just make them a second version of me. If I could just get a second version of me and train them up, then we'll get so much more done. That was the wrong thinking. You, you're better off just documenting what you do. What I like to do is just use Loom, and I just record myself doing something that's repetitive in my business. Like, okay, here's how you upload the podcast. Here's how you put in the title. Here's how you put in the show notes. Here's how you schedule it. This is the day we schedule it. And then now that I have it recorded, I can hand that off to somebody and I don't ever have to do it again. Because what I realized, Sarah, was that your audience only expects like certain things from you, right? So like they expect to hear Sarah on the podcast, but they don't expect Sarah to do the editing and that's okay in the beginning, but at some point you got to say, you know what? What if I could give away that editing time so that I could do more interviews or so I could work on a course that I want to create that actually makes money in my business? And so you got to document first and then start by just start simple. You don't have to go all in. A lot of people think, well, hey, I can't afford to hire somebody. But what I realized, Sarah, was one of the first things I outsourced was doing my weekly blog post, the picture that goes on the blog post, the featured image. And what I realized I was spending 20 minutes trying to design that in Canva and all that stuff. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Somebody actually, somebody asked me like, Jonathan, how much is your time worth? And back then I was like, hundred dollars an hour. Okay. So if it's taking you 20, 30 minutes, that's 50 bucks, right? Yeah. So would you pay somebody $50 to design a weekly image for you? I said, no way. And he said, you're already doing it. Gotcha. I got the lesson. And so you don't have to start off big. You can start off just, hey, two hours a week, six, seven, eight, nine dollars an hour. You can find really good help out there. And then build it up over time. And so eventually I hired a OBM, which is great for people in the online business space. It, it stands for online business manager who can handle more of the operations and allow you to do what you love, the creative part. Where do you recommend searching for help? I've had excellent 
I found excellent people, people who've been with me for six, seven years mm -hmm. on Upwork. Mm -hmm. So you can go to Upwork and search and find people. And again, you can start off two hours a week, five hours a week. You can put limits on them. And yet it gives you back. Think about it. If you just gave, if you got somebody five hours a week, that's five hours a week that you get back to do something else. So I think the biggest struggle for a lot of entrepreneurs is they really challenge to growing is a capacity issue. So if I'm only able to work 40 hours, that's all I can do for the business. But if I've got team around me, now we can grow because we're at 300 hours a week that we can put into things. And you don't get there over, overnight. You need to move towards that, you know, growing that capacity. Yeah, that's a good point because that's kind of where I'm at now is thinking about getting like a virtual assistant or something yeah. because like you said, there's certain things like being on the podcast that you have to do yourself, but then other things like whether it's editing or administrative tasks or whatever, as long as you have a SOP, they learn how to do it. I mean, yeah, because I guess ultimately how much is your time worth? It's like you were saying, let's say you charge 50 bucks an hour, a hundred bucks an hour. But you can hire someone and pay them 10 bucks and it takes them an hour. I mean, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's common sense after a while. But of course, when someone's starting out or they don't have a big budget, it's, it's hard to. It is. And what I had to do is I had to realize, wait a minute, I can't have nine to five thinking on this. I've got to have a business entrepreneurial mind. And what I realized, and it took actually a, a mentor to tell me, Jonathan, like, Hiring somebody is not a cost. It's actually an investment because if it frees you up five hours so that you could go sell a coaching program that makes you thousands of dollars, that's a better time spent than this over here. And so it's, it's an investment. It's, it's not a cost and it's hard. I know in the beginning, but you have to eventually make that shift. And the good news is you don't have to go all in. You don't have to hire somebody full time, right? You don't have to hire somebody $40,000 a year to go from zero to 40,000. So yeah, definitely. Well, awesome. Well, I appreciate your time today. Was there anything else that you wanted to discuss that we hadn't gone over? No, I think, I think the, you know, the message here is that uh, you can start a business on the side and an online business is great because it, it doesn't create as much of a all in time commitment, like trying to start a brick and mortar business and you can keep the cost low in the beginning and really learn some of the skills. And then when you're ready, start outsourcing, building that business and, and growing it. At the end of the day, it's about serving people with your story, your skills, your experience, and your message. So that, that's kind of the big takeaway. Yeah, I appreciate it. And that's kind of what I always say is an online business, it has such low overhead that it can cost next to nothing to start one. And so if someone's looking for a frugal way, I guess, to start a business, I definitely recommend going the online route. There's so many different things you can do versus, you know, like you said, retail, brick and mortar, that the overhead is just really high and probably increasingly getting higher and higher as time goes on. So, so well, people can find you at marketyourmessage.com or they can get the book at yourmessagemattersbook.com. I'll also have show notes at thesarahstjohn.com forward slash message. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me.